Hi, I'm Sam Hawley, coming to you from the lands of the Gadigal people. This is ABC News Daily. In 2021, Brittany Higgins became known across Australia after she publicly alleged she'd been raped in an office at Parliament House. The man she accused, Bruce Learman, has always maintained his innocence. The case led to nationwide outrage about the treatment of women. Now, with a retrial being abandoned and the charges dropped, the focus has shifted to how our legal system is working. Today, Dr Rachel Bergen, a lecturer in criminal justice at Swinburne University and sexual assault advocate, on the trauma that's playing out in courtrooms across the country. today, not because we want to be here, but because we have to be here. We fundamentally recognise... Rachel, in March 2021, Brittany Higgins made an unexpected appearance at a rally in Canberra outside Parliament House. Yes, yeah, so Brittany Higgins spoke out about her or alleged treatment or treatment uh, after she alleged um, a sexual offence against her as part of really a rallying cry about the treatment of women more broadly, particularly in the halls of power. Together, we can bring about real, meaningful reform to the workplace culture inside Parliament House and hopefully every workplace to ensure the next generation of women can benefit from a safer and more equitable Australia. Mm, It's a a big issue, the treatment of women. I mean, she also spoke about the glass ceiling still being in place, the power structures of the institutions not supporting women. So, I mean, it was a a huge rally. It was a big time. And since then, it's been a really long, hard battle. She faced hours of cross-examination during the trial that followed and began in October this year. But it's been a long, gruelling battle for all parties. It, It certainly has been. We have seen this case dragged through the media far before we even saw the the trial. Certainly this case has shone a light on treatment of complainants, on the, you know, problems and challenges with the criminal justice system and not just with the trial process, but it was also politicised. This is a really important issue for all women across Australia. This is uh, obviously a multi-party issue of which we're all concerned. You know, for for Higgins and for Lerman, this is not a political issue. This is a personal issue, uh, but... You know, it's it's certainly been politicised and, and, you know, uh, considered in this broader context around um, mm. sexual violence, but also the role that the politicians have played uh, in the response. Mm. And in late October, the process was halted because of juror misconduct. And Brittany Higgins spoke outside the court after that decision was made and really spoke about her anguish. And she spoke of an asymmetrical criminal justice system. When I did speak up, I never fully understood our asymmetrical criminal justice system. But I do now. I was required to surrender my telephones, my passwords, messages, photos and my data to him. My life has been publicly scrutinised, open for the world to see. Many of you in the media have been called out for labelling the last few weeks the Higgins trial. But I don't blame you, because it's very clear who has been on trial. What did she mean by that? Well, I think what Brittany Higgins was really pointing out there is that there is a a whole bunch of focus around the rights of the accused person, but less so about the rights of someone who alleges that a crime has been committed against them. In relation to sexual offences, there is an imbalance of power. Uh, Accused people are given rights that people, complainants and people who allege they've experienced sexual violence aren't given. Mm. And then, of course, we were expecting a retrial, but late last week, the ACT Director of Public Prosecutions, Shane Drumgold, announced that that trial would be dropped. 
I've made the difficult decision that it is no longer in the public interest to pursue a prosecution at the risk of a complainant's life. Ms Higgins has faced a level of personal attack that I've not seen in over 20 years of doing this work. She's done so with bravery, grace and dignity, and it is my hope that this will now stop. Were you surprised by that? Look, I, I wasn't surprised. What I uh, want to highlight is that the prosecution have maintained that they continue to believe that there is sufficient evidence to prosecute. Uh, that's the first test that, that a prosecutor must consider when, when deciding whether to pursue a prosecution. The second test is a public interest test. Brittany Higgins is a part of that public and um, the ACT prosecution, prosecution guide specifically uh, notes that, you know, we must consider the impact on any person in relation to the offence, including the complainant. So the risk to her life is such that that there is, um, you know, that it, that it means that it's not in the public interest to prosecute. Now, we saw in the weeks, uh, in the middle of Brittany Higgins giving her testimony and, and being cross-examined that we had to delay that part of the trial. She, she was absent from court for a few days. That gave us an indication of her um, mental state. So the prosecutor must also consider what's in, what's in the interests of, of the complainant. And in this case, it's unsafe for her to continue. Mm, and Bruce Learman, he's always ma- maintained his innocence and the law's not found him guilty of anything. Yeah, so that's right. Um, you know, this is a difficult decision because it's not a good decision for either party. Nobody gets a legal resolution. We're in a bit of a legal limbo here. Mm, I can see that both parties are now also pursuing civil actions. That is, in Higgins' case, for instance, she is now suing two former Liberal cabinet ministers she worked for in the parliament. So there's other legal avenues for both of them. Lawyers for Brittany Higgins will seek $3 million in compensation from former ministers Linda Reynolds and Michaelia Cash and the Commonwealth. Higgins' lawyers have indicated they will sue for sexual harassment, sexual and disability discrimination. Yeah, so so we know that Brittany Higgins is seeking compensation for things like sort of her future economic losses, past losses, the the costs, you know, out-of-pocket expenses, um, such as seeking medical advice and and, uh, counselling and et cetera. So, you know, what we see uh, from Lerman's camp, I suppose, um, you know, we'll have to wait and see what he decides to do. You mentioned the media coverage and in the words of the trial judge, Lucy McCallum, journalists were practically hanging off the rafters to watch this court case unfold. So I want to talk to you more broadly about the judicial system because it's really very unusual, isn't it, for a rape case to be so closely scrutinised in this country. They're normally held in camera behind closed doors. Yeah, so ordinarily we wouldn't know much about the complainant in a rape trial. We wouldn't hear the details of the case, and you know, perhaps at all. What this case did was offer the public a view into a rape trial. Mm. It showed or allowed us to really see the types of questions that are asked, the types of attitudes that permeate the rape trial, uh, social attitudes and media coverage. Um, That's something we don't often get to see. Ordinarily, these trials happen behind closed doors. That's to protect um, vulnerable witnesses, um, i.e. complainants. That's important. Higgins has paved the way for many women to report, but she wouldn't have been able to do that if she didn't speak up. Rachel, let's just leave this trial behind for now. Try and unpack for me, you know, what you see as the problems with our legal system in terms of all parties, of course. Yeah, so... First, we know that sexual offences are have historically been and continue to be underreported. Um, for those that do report, a small amount proceed to charge. In the ACT, it's about 16% of cases that are reported to police proceed to charge. Of those cases, an even smaller amount result in a conviction. Now, that is because of a set of complex issues. Now, firstly, we know that rape myths, that is things that are wrong, incorrect, but widely held ideas within the community about rape, uh, about people who experience rape and about people who perpetrate rape, play out in rape trials. 
What sort of myths are they? So there's many. Um, some are that women ask for it, so to speak, or that um, they're to be blamed for their victimisation for some reason. Um, it might be that the myth that men simply can't resist their sexual urges and thus are kind of, you know, slaves to their bodies and, and shouldn't be held accountable. And so you're, you're saying these sort of rape myths really play out in the courtroom? Yes, certainly. We see um, defence use these and draw on these types of myths in their questioning of um, complainants. So, for example, we see women being asked about, you know, how much they drank and then, you know, if they think that maybe they were drunk and they were more likely to consent in certain circumstances or uh, that they're unreliable witnesses because they were drunk. We see, um, you know, evidence presented about what women were wearing, uh, whether they flirted with the accused in the, you know, even in days or months prior. Those problems permeate rape trials. That's a common tactic. So what, in your view then, Rachel, needs to change? Well, you know, for a long time we have been reforming the criminal justice system in relation to sexual offences, but we are merely tinkering around the edges. What we need is whole-of-system reforms. It might look like a specialist court with judges who are educated about rape myths and who know how to explain to juries the types of evidence they need to uh, focus on and the, the types of myths that they need to challenge. But we also need to think about the fact that survivors or complainants experience the criminal justice system as traumatising in its own right. Uh, it's been called the second rape. Some survivors say that it was worse than the assault. That's a problem. We owe something to survivors, to people who report crime. We owe them a safe system. Dr Rachel Bergen is a lecturer in criminal justice at Swinburne University and the CEO of Rape and Sexual Assault Research and Advocacy. If this discussion has raised issues with you, you can call 1800 RESPECT, 1800 737 732. This episode was produced by Flint Duxfield and Chris Dengate, who also did the mix. Our supervising producer is Sydney Pete. I'm Sam Hawley. ABC News Daily will be back again tomorrow. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to listen to more free podcasts or download the ABC Listen app and stream ad-free. 